log entry, the Catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position 2 degrees 40 minutes north, 125 degrees 37 minutes east. Wind brisk, sky fair. Remarks, departed Sangi Islands after fulfillment of promise. Reason for promise, Kang's treasure and the ghost of Tangulan. <laughs> It was three days out of Basilan, following the final sailing orders from my employer, Kuji Kang, that we raised the smoking island of Tangulan. It's a volcanic island, eight miles square and uninhabited, rimmed by coral reef, its active crater grumbling intermittently and spewing out thick, gaseous smoke that hangs continually over the vicinity in a thick cloud. Reminded me of Iwo Jima, the most unpleasant island in my world with its jumbled heaps of black sand and the complete lack of vegetation. But it was this island that had been drawing us like a magnet over thousands of miles of ocean. It was here that the Scarlet Queen would perform the duty she was originally built to perform. It was here that I'd live up to the agreement I'd signed with Kang over a year ago. I would at last see the historical $10 million treasure lifted out of the scuttled Chinese junk. I'd see it resting finally in the hold of the Scarlet Queen. We stood around the northern tip of the island and saw the last of the sun as it disappeared behind the pall of smoke. The constant evening gloom that it caused added to the feeling of loneliness. That was all right with me because loneliness was just what we needed at this point. The feeling was fine, but it didn't last long enough. My crewman, Nielsen, who was on lookout, broke the spell just as we approached the only reef passage marked on our chart. Hey, the wheel! What do you got, Nielsen? Get the red pole of the reef on the red side of the passage! Gallagher! Yeah, Skipper, I thought we were going to be alone on this blasted island. How did I take the wheel and hold away from the pass? I'm going forward to have a look. The hull was a lugger. Resting at an easy angle on the coral, a little better than halfway through the pass. Her masts broken, her rigging tangled. There was no sign of life on her. With binoculars, I could see a rude camp on the beach beyond. There was no sign of life there either. The figures of four men I saw were sprawled on the sand. And if they were alive, I was sure they'd be on their feet watching us as we came in. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log, and every week, a league further in the strange voyage of the Scarlet Queen. and the silent camp on the beach could have meant anything. Tragedy that was coincidence or a setup by Kang's arch enemy, Constantino. I left the queen outside the reef with Gallagher in charge. I put our small boat over the side and Nielsen and I rode in through the pass over the quiet water of the lagoon. Stepped out onto the white sand. The volcano rumbled now and then. Huge land crabs scudded away from the bodies as we approached the camp told a pretty plain story. Three of the men lay on some black sand that had been scraped into a couch. The fourth lay a few feet away. Beside him was a medical kit. Just beyond his fingertips was a hypodermic syringe and needle. What do you make of it, Captain? Stay back, Nielsen. Whatever they died of wiped out the whole crew, including the doctor. Maybe it's a plague. Huh? Looks like it. There was something about this whole island that rubs me the wrong way. I know what you mean. Come on, let's get back to the ship. An hour later, we'd run the passage into the lagoon and crept along the inside edge of the reef for 200 yards to the unmistakable formation of coral that was our last landmark. We dropped the hook, 
and performed a maneuver that was the culmination of all the other maneuvers on the voyage of the Scarlet Queen. We drifted back, letting out anchor cable, until we reached a spot which, if the chart was correct and no one had beaten us to it, was directly over the hull that guarded Kang's treasure in the lightless, smoke-shadowed water ten fathoms below. But the feeling of elation was completely foreign to the atmosphere of Tangulan. Gallagher and I stood at the rail, feeling the oppressiveness, the uneasiness, as night settled down over us, and the glow from the volcano's crater flickered weirdly on the cloud of smoke above. The atmosphere was bad enough, but Nielsen's hail made it worse. Skipper! Captain Carney! What, Nielsen? There was a light on the island, sir. Where? Yeah. There it is, up there. You see it? Yeah. What do you think it is, sir? Oh, there it's gone. Nielsen, go kill all our lights. Roll out the crew. Tell them to draw for double anchor watches tonight. Yes, sir. That's an odd one, Skipper. What do you make of it? I don't know, Red. Could have been molten lava rolling down from the crater. <laughs> what are you handing me? I never heard of lava flowing uphill like that light did. All right, then. You name it. You find four men dead from the plague on an unpopulated island. So, it must be a ghost. I hope it is, Red. But just in case it isn't, go break out enough rifles to arm the crew, will you? Gallagher and I split the night so that one of us was on deck all the time with two armed crewmen. The shoreside light appeared a few more times. But when the light of morning forced through the smoke cloud, the island was silent and foreboding. But that's all. We had breakfast and turned two on the most important day's work Wait, of the voyage. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We'll rig the gear in the mainmast to handle both the dive and the platform and the cargo gear. Nelson. Yes, sir. You and Crowder fall two with me. We'll break out the diving gear and give the pump a try. Yes, sir. Platform's ready for you, Skipper. Go ahead. Rig me that watertight flood lamp, Red. There's no sun getting down there. I'll need light. It's as good as Rick, Skipper. at the rail and watched the big lamp sink slowly over the side, throwing a hazy green-tinted circle of light out into the clear water. Went down three fathoms, four fathoms, five fathoms, six. Went down seven fathoms, seven and a half, and I stopped it. Hold it! Steady as it is on the light! Steady as it is! The circle of light had settled over the outline of the junk was leaning about 30 degrees to port. It's after half and part of the main house crushed into a crevice in the coral. It's movable spars and rigging swinging uneasily in the current. It's there, Skipper. The whole blasted thing is there. Sure it's there. Get the suit ready. Cola, get the suit on the platform. Crowd is stand by the winch. We're ready to go to work. In 10 minutes, I've gotten into the suit platform had lowered me below the surface, and I was left with no sound but the light bubbling of my escape valve and the faint throb of the air being pumped down to me. It was the first grip in the pit of the stomach that comes with adjusting yourself to a new element. Then the awareness of long shapes that darted into the light from the darkness and left again. The desire to look behind you when you can't. Then the platform reached a level on the sunken deck. Hold it, Red. I stepped onto the sharp slant of the slippery deck. The passageway into the main house that held the treasure was blocked by a shoulder of coral. I made my way along its starboard side to a group of three portholes that let enough light in to show me the interior. I stood for a good minute, lost in the sight of what lay just a few feet away from me lost in the thought of what had led up to this instant and what the four neatly stowed boxes meant in Kang's life, in Gallagher's life, in the crew's lives, and in my life. Skipper! It was the crackle of the intercom circuit in Red's voice that brought me back to the fact that it had to be gotten out of the cabin now that we'd found it. Skipper, what's going on? You aren't moving. Skipper, you all right? Yeah, Red. I'm all right. What the devil are you doing? I'm looking at it, Red. It's here. Well, let's get it started up. I'll really believe it then. It's not as easy as that. The passageway is jammed shut. We can get it out in one load, but we'll have to cut in through the side. Well, you better come up then. We'll get the gear ready. Yeah. And give me plenty of help with my line, Red. 
This deck doesn't like me. It's spongy with rot. Well, watch your step. Don't let anything happen now. Hello, Brad. This is the most cautious few feet I've traveled since the first time I walked it off. I'll bet you were cute, Skipper. So they tell me, mate. So they tell me. With the excitement of being on the verge of recovery, I don't think any of us took time to think of the night before the ghost of Tango Land. Or at least no one mentioned it. And when it floated in on us, it was so silent that none of us knew. I'd gotten out of the diving suit and we were grouped on the landed side of the deck putting lines on the wrecking bars and saws and the rest of the cutting gear. And we didn't hear it until he pushed his head up over the side to see it and spoke. Who be you? Hey, it's got Hey, put down the gun. I'll call my volcano down on the lot of you. Who are you? I'm poor Sam Brennan. How'd you get here? I hid behind a coconut log. Drifted down on you with the tide. Who be you? Bill Carney, captain of the ship. Was that you on the mountain with the light? Hey, Gonna come aboard, Captain. I have a hunger for Christian food. And I have a word for you. Bring him aboard. Keep your eye on him. Two crewmen reached down, took him by each arm, and hauled him aboard. What came up over the rail did justice to the head that topped it. His hair was shaggy and shoulder length, his face matted with wild beard. His body was gaunt, covered by a collection of wet rags that was part cloth, part skin, part seaweed. No makeup man in costume or anywhere could have done as well for the Ben Gunn character out of Treasure Island. We took him to the galley and opened a tin of hash for him. His wild, slightly vacant eyes flashed, and he fell to with a will with his right hand. Held out his left for me to see. The nails were raw, heat blackened. What? What be the cause of that, do you reckon? Oh, wait a minute. Let's start farther back than that. Where'd you come from? Come from? My island. I've been a copra grower there before my volcano overflowed and burned out my groves and everything else. But I... I've been alone since then. Been being ten years ago. Ten years alone on that island? Ah, uh, there's company enough there is. And the voices at night. And work enough for the fish to catch and caring for my volcano. Yeah, sure. Now, about your hand. Uh, what happened to them? Torture. They was hard, cruel to poor Sam Brennan. They was. Who? Eight of them. That come not two days back. Eight? Yeah. Them that run the craft on my reef yonder. And laid them poor dead corpses out on the sand. Well, how do you like that? You mean those men didn't die here? Uh, they come as they are. Poor dead corpses. Poor Sam Brennan saw them laid out, neat like they are. Then I I stepped into the midst of the living, my arm raised to friendship. And they all fell upon me, hard cruel. Forced into my fingers, heated needles. Leaving the marks that you see there, see? Pretty rough. Why did they do it, Sam? Uh, for my wisdom, no less. But I told them little. Only that I saw it sail in and saw no more. Uh, they'll get no talk from poor Sam Brennan with saw cruelty. Saw what sail in, Sam? Uh, the, the Chinese craft. We're lying over now. You... There you are, Red. Constantino. How'd they get it, Skipper? How'd they get here before How'd us? How'd they get any place? Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you that and more. I've been at the side at night, moving here, moving there, covered by the growls of my volcano. They learned of my island from a servant and... Marceline. Sure, sure. We've been nicely suckered. That death camp set up so we wouldn't risk infection to look over the island. They sit there and watch us load the stuff on the queen. Then what, Sam, do you know? Hey, this is what I know. There's a fast power yacht in the lagoon around the island on the far side of the pass. Inside the reef? Hey. Oh, that's great. A and the wrecked ship at the reef passage is prepared with dynamite, no less, so that when you start to leave, a touch of the finger will topple it into the passage. And you'll be bottled up here at the mercy of that craft which is armed like a man of war. That I know. That poor Sam Brennan heard himself. Yeah, thanks for the dope, Sam. I take it they have a detonator set up on shore to blow the charge. How many men are with it? Well, there'll be one alone. Rest be on the boat. If I took care of the ones on the boat, could you manage the one ashore? The one? Matched against the knights and my volcano and me? <laughs> oh, we'll manage him. We will. Good. One more thing, Sam. Will you go to the wreck with me before you go ashore? Aye, aye. But, but I'll go the way you come. Wait a minute, Skipper. That's putting your head right into it, isn't well, it? Well, what else, Red? 
Well, That'll be bottled up here like fish in a glass tank. Yeah, we, we ought to be able to cut the wires to that dynamite before they get the idea that it's any more than a curiosity trip. They must have expected well, I that. I hope you're right, Skip. I'll have to take over the diving, Red. You take it. Work as fast as you can. Cut a six-foot hole into that cabin, then it'll all come out in one load. The gear's all ready. Okay, Skip, I'll do my best. That'll be good enough, Red. And be careful, huh? <laughs> me? You telling me to be careful. Red was in the suit and on his way down by the time Sam Brennan dropped over the side and I got myself ready and headed toward the wreck of the small boat. I took with me an explosive detonator rigged for dry cell batteries, a couple of small blocks with well-oiled sheaves and enough strong light line to reach across the hundred yards between shore and the wreck. I boarded it before Sam arrived, climbed down into the cabin and started tearing the place to pieces. The first ten minutes of searching weren't enjoyable, but they weren't as bad as the next twenty when I dropped into the hold and still hadn't found the charge. By that time, I'd been there too long for my visit to look like one of curiosity to anyone. When I did find it seven sticks strong down in the filthy bilge, my heart was pounding and no one could have convinced me that I didn't rip the wires loose a split second before the man at the detonator had decided to push the plunger home. But when I had them harmless in my hands, even the bilge air smelled as sweet as life itself. What be your plan, Captain? All you have to do is go ashore, Sam, with the end of this line. I've got the detonator set so that when the power yacht hits the line just as she enters the reef passage, this wreck we're on will blow up right in their faces. You understand, Sam? It has a good sound. My ship is on one side of the passage. They'll approach from the other. The only thing I want to be sure of is that you'll leave enough room on my side so that the Scarlet Queen can squeeze through. It's proper vengeance they get from poor Sam Brennan. That's right. All right, Sam. Get going. <laughs> With the end of the line looped around his tattered waist, he slipped silently into the water, with only his head showing behind his log. He started shoreward toward a spot I'd pointed out to him. It may have been minutes, but it seemed like hours before he got there. I watched him secure the line to a jutting rock and then disappear. I heaved my line as taut as I could, reeved it through one of the blocks I'd rigged, made it fast to the detonator so that the slightest tug would blow the charge. Then I went back to the queen. You're back all right, Captain. I was sure glad to see you, sir. Thanks, Nielsen. Where's Mr. Gallagher? Oh, he's still submerged. What's the trouble? Well, nothing now, sir. He was on his way up. The cargo was aboard, but the chief's line fouled, and we had trouble getting him out of the cabin of the junk. He was down too long. We didn't want to risk Ben's bringing him up faster than we should. Well, we'll have to speed it up a little, Nielsen. Get on the intercom. Tell him I'm back, and he has to get up as fast as he can. Yes, sir. Caller, stand by the windlass. I'll get the motor started, and we'll inch up on the anchor. <laughs> Over the hook! Nielsen, where's the diving platform? Four presents down, sir. We'll have to have more speed. Tell Gallagher to hang on. We'll have to weigh anchor before we get him aboard. Anchors away, sir. And coming up. Anchors away. Where's the platform, Nielsen? Two and a half presents, sir. We'll have to forget pressure and everything else and get him aboard. Tell him that. Tell him the power boat expected is in sight about a thousand yards off our bow. It was natural that it should show. We'd used too much time. Time enough for anyone to realize that something was wrong and decide to find out what. Anchor's in sight, sir! Nielsen! Platform's in sight, sir! So I stood there with my hand on the throttle, not able to open it, and watched the Constantino boat push its sleek bow around a point of land. She was moving slowly, still only inquisitive, still unable to see what was going on on our decks. Anchor is up, sir! Secure the anchor! He's clear of the water, sir. The platform's clear. I waited another 30 precious seconds until Gallagher had been swung inboard. Then I opened the throttle. Our wake churned, and as we picked up speed, the Scarlet Queen built a bow wave that curled and gleamed milkily in the gloom. That bow wave was like a starter's gun to the power craft. She built a bigger one of her own as her throttle was open, and she picked up speed that made our pace look like that of a canal scow. I didn't have time for any kind of caution. When we covered half the distance of the pass, I swung toward the island, blind to the reefs or channels or depths, knowing only that I needed that swing to make the narrow lane between the reef and the trip cord that would blow the booby trap in the wreck. By the time I'd made the turn and straightened out for the run, the powerboat had closed to within less than 100 yards of us, and the men aboard her opened up to stop us with every means they had. Take cover, men! Get down in the deck! Come after the cockpit, Brent! Stand by to take the wheel in case I catch one of these things! Come on, Skipper! I crouched as low as I could and watched the series of bullet holes appear in the deck in front of me. And felt the splinters as another burst caught the mizzen boom above me. 
can we do it, Skipper? I'll know in a minute, Red. We got 25 yards to go. They got about 60. You're awful close to the reef, Skipper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reef, Captain! We're going to sweep the reef! I eased a scant foot or two towards the line in the middle of the channel. By the time our bow slid by the reaching coral, the powerboat was no more than 25 yards astern. Her range was point blank now, but that wasn't what I was worried about. Stepped out into the pass, felt the first ocean swell lift our bow. Our stern swung to port in the cart, and I fought it back with hard helm. Then I just hung on and hoped because there was nothing else to do. Kill the motor. We made it, Red. Well, don't just stand there with your mouth open. Hmm? Oh, uh, I, I, sir, I, I, stand by to make sail. Crowman took a while to pull their eyes away from the mangled wreck that the sleek power yacht had suddenly turned into. Her superstructure was torn to bits. She was afire and settling by the stern in the reef passage. Then they stumbled to their stations. Let's stop it, Chief! Make sail! The mainsail climbed into the smoke dulled sky. The jibs. Then the mizzen. And the Scarlet Queen, as though feeling the success herself. And the lifting of strain and tension kneeled in thanks to her own gods. And leaned before the winds they sent her in answer to her prayer. It's a board, Skipper. It's a board and we're out of there. It's a board, Red. Well, you don't sound too happy about it. Happy? Red, I don't even believe it. Yeah, I kind of know what you mean, Skipper. After what's led up to it, it don't seem right just to pick it up like some bales of rubber or some sacks of rice and... Put it in the hole? Yeah, that's about it. But poor Sam Brennan can have his island. We're out of there. Yeah, that's a little hard to believe, too. But assuming that we are, where are we back? Back to Hong Kong to sign over the stuff we don't believe to Kang. Uh, a city, Skipper. Yeah, we've earned a celebration. And I can't think of a better place than Hong Kong. I don't see any reason for waiting till we get there, if you know what I mean. I think I do. Drink, Skipper? You do know you're psychic. After you, mate. <laughs> After you. Log entry. The Catch Scarlet Queen. Miles traveled from San Francisco. 21,308. Wind brisk. Sky fair. Carrying full sail. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney. Master. of the Scarlet Queen stars Elliot Lewis as Phil Carney with Ed Max as Gallagher. And tonight featured Bill Johnstone as Sam and William Conrad as Nielsen. Music scored and conducted by Richard O'Rod. The Scarlet Queen, a command radio production directed by James Burton, is written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman. This program came to you from Hollywood. Hollywood.